Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back for part two of this morning. Uh, the second keynote of today will be by Ben Silcox, and will be around the singularity of purpose. Uh, ben is the Chief Data and Digital Officer at Habas Helia. Um, he runs the Unilever Data Program. He works on a number of brands at Unilever. Um, he's a rock star of data. Think of him like the Bruce Springsteen of data, only a more tanned, a more buff version. I think I can only disappoint after that. Um, so thank you very much, uh, everybody. Um, kind of what I want to talk about um, is just uh, actually a little bit less about the data and a little bit more about how um, what we do with it as brands and businesses um, can actually find something in common with, um, with people. Um, there has been a, um, a divergence that's been taking place uh, over the last four or five years with technology and with businesses. Um, and being able to start to look at that on the basis of um, how the journey that people have been on and businesses have been on can come back together. Um, and that journey has been going for a long time, all the way back to the very earliest recordings of data and, and starting to use that to understand uh, you know, agriculture and crops um, to where you know, being able to utilize that with a personal computer um, and how people started to um, have a grasp of their own data, whether those were files or spreadsheets or whatever they were, um, and starting to make that more useful on a daily basis. Everybody remembers the Palm Pilot, um, uh, the, the, the first diary um, and um, very dodgy games, um, through to um, what was just released last week with the, with the watch. Um, but all of this is a journey that people have been on um, with being able to access data, but access it in a way that's a little bit more meaningful, um, a little bit more useful to them. Um, and that's been good, but there's a little bit of a shift that's taking place. Um, that shift is one that's becoming more and more and more um, sort of polarized. Um, and as brands, um, we have this challenge that how do we make sure that the technology that's available to us and what we understand from this um, doesn't get so fragmented and so separated? Um, the gap is getting bigger and bigger, and the reason that gap is getting bigger is because at the moment, um, businesses are tend to use data to further their aims, um, actually about making things more targeted. It's more about the performance. It's more about placing things in front of audiences. In digital, particularly, you've got this massive explosion in terms of programmatic advertising, which is great. It means that at a scale um, and at a speed that's never been done before, we can make a message um, right and relevant and contextual to people. Uh, and the performance of that, in terms of being able to do that, uh, increases. The problem is, that consumer behavior is changing. There are now 144 million people worldwide um, who have active ad blockers on. They're actively seeking out ways to stop what brands and businesses are spending their money on from actually taking place. Um, the memorable awareness of most online display is below 1%. Um, only 7% is actually seen and taken any notice of and can be recalled. So there's a massive gap between what businesses and brands are doing and the opportunity of what data is doing for them um, that's in its still very early nascent stages. Um, whilst that's going on, data is becoming even more accessible um, for real people. Um, whether it's looking at your Instagram performance and being able to see the impact that you know, your Instagram posts are happening, um, whether it's accessing you know, the health data that comes from wearables and comes from your phone to understand how well you sleep, um, whether it's being able to understand how influential or not influential you are, um, all the way to actually having an impact on what you do, or whether you're setting a goal to um, you know, smoke less, drink less, sleep more, whatever it might be. So people are, are, are gaining this access to information that's their information. Um, and this is in complete contrast to the data that brands use and capture um, and actually what real people are doing. Um, some people are trying to get it right because they're understanding how to bring that closer together. Um, Uber, as an example, we all know about. But I think the impact of Uber goes far beyond um, what it does as a service of getting a car 
when you want it, where you want it, at a good price. What's actually happening now is it's changing the way that families operate. So people are sending their, their children to school in Uber cars. So this is having a knock-on effect into education. It's having a knock-on effect into what are now the catchment areas of where people live. Uh, it's having a knock-on effect into how parents are viewing childcare and the possibility of childcare uh, for working families. Um, it's having a knock-on effect in the amount of driver's licenses being gained by young people. There's been a 40% drop-off in American um, cities that Uber operates in, in 16 and 17-year-old Americans getting driver's licenses. Um, and when they delved into this, they said, why do I need to drive? There's so many ways, whether it's through being a member of a car club, accessing Uber, etc. So these products and services that on the surface seem like something really slick, really efficient, really helpful, are actually having a massive knock-on effect. Um, payments, um, probably the next big wave that are really going to change things. Um, you know, and at the moment, um, very few, if any, brands are even remotely operating in a way that can provide this kind of, of experience. So there's a massive divergence at the moment that's only going to get greater. Um, it's not about these devices, it's about what is coming out of these devices that are, at the moment, um, there's very little value add being given. Um, very early adoption, very early development, tech devices, very geeky. Some people like them, some people don't. But what's really interesting is there's so few people, so few brands at the moment looking and going, what can I put on top of that? What can I do with that? Um, so we're moving into biology. Um, and you know the next wave of wearables are actually not going to be something that you actually put on. Uh, it's going to be something that becomes a part of your body. Um, where you are, what you're doing, what that means to you. Um, whether it's for medical reasons like diabetes, whether it's for um, you know, helping to make sure that you have a healthy pregnancy, whatever it might be. Um, this, is, this is coming, and these are the kind of applications that for real people, it makes data something that they don't think about the data, they think about the usefulness of it. So it provokes us into needing to ask ourselves a question, um, which is um, if we're going to be more data-driven, which I don't think I patronize anybody into saying that we don't need. But if we are going to be more data driven, how are we going to do that in a way that's more meaningful? Um, how are we going to bring back together more singularity um, of, of what that can do in the services and the way we communicate, the way we advertise, the way we build our brands? Um, one of those is about what's popular. Um, you know, huge amounts of digital activity, both by consumers um, and also by um, you know, platforms, um, create these waves of populist um, uh, interest. Um, that could be around uh, you know, TV programs. Um, the, the pure um, focus of Twitter at the moment in terms of being able to amplify and work with TV is immense. Um, it, it's incredible when you look at um, the data that sits underneath um, Twitter, and you can actually map um, exactly what's happening in a movie or in a TV program with the Twitter conversations. Um, Netflix did a different kind of um, use of data to provide uh, how you would build a TV program. Um, Twitter is actually able to create the same kind of prediction about what kind of emotional response people are going to give and what kind of response people are going to give um, to the minute uh, through a TV program. Um, so. If it's populist, if it's popular, there is a wave, and there's a wave that comes in moments. Um, for a brand, it's a case of how do you add value? That value can't be about putting a piece of advertising in there. As much as everybody talks about the Oreo moment, it was still disruptive. It was disruptive in a, in a context, but it was still about putting a piece of advertising in place. There's got to be another layer of value that can sit within what's popular. Um, what's really important? Um, Academic research uh, shows very clearly that about 80% of our conscious time is actually spent thinking about ourselves. As much as we like to think about other people, um, only about 20% of our conscious time is spent actively thinking about other people. So if we are going to um, be more meaningful and, and, and reach people with, with our brands and our products, um, it's actually got to be personal. 
Um, and, and I would say that in general, probably 95% of businesses do a very poor job of being personal to people. Putting someone's name on a website page or on the top of them an email or on some other piece of communication is not personal. Personal is contextual. Uh, it's about where and when and why and what happened before and after. And at the moment, most of the use of data by brands is very much media driven. It's about buying media and placing that media in the right space. That's about a channel. And at that level of channel specification, you don't get the sense of a journey, the sense of what happened before and after. Um, some work that we did um, with, a, with a, 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 a mobile phone retailer um, meant that we were able to predict within seven days people who were going to buy a phone within seven days. The only way you get that is when you have a sense of what's happening chronologically, um, what's happening in a sense of time and how that gets built, what signals that you're listening to. So personalization um, is such a wanky word and we've all heard it, um, but actually figuring out what's meaningfully personal to people um, in a way that is natural, uh, in a way that is um, added value um, is one of the single biggest challenges uh, that, that we need to get around. Um, and then what might be needed? A, a global survey um, actually by Havas Media, part of the Havas Group, um, over uh, 120 countries. The single biggest um, stat that came out of it, but one that I think makes everybody want to sit up and take notice, is that 74% um, of brands that people interact with, people would not care if they disappeared. If they were not there tomorrow, the vast majority of brands that people interact with, whether they buy their products and, pur and purchase them, they would not care if they were not there tomorrow. That was against a matrix of meaningfulness and relevance. What does it do for me? Does it make my life better? Um, and how does it bring value to me? Um, so I think there's a very clear expectation that businesses are part of uh, social culture. Um, gone are the days of businesses purely being able to operate for profit and, and saying, well, we hire people and we have a supply chain uh, and we make stuff. Um, and, and that's not what we expect now. We don't expect businesses to do that um, purely uh, on their own without any sense of, of how they interact with us and what's important to us. So when we start thinking about what might be needed for people, and what's meaningful ongoing throughout the rest of our life, education and health and community and those things that actually we spend a lot of our time interacting in, um, it sort of creates an imperative for us to understand how we can be valuable in that space. There are people who are starting to do this and starting to do it well, um, starting to bring um, the use of data into a very natural, positive uh, sense and add value, um, whether it's a runway who are purely data-driven in what they serve up. Um, they are only putting clothes uh, for sale that are purely based on a context of what's right. Um, their conversion rates are phenomenal. They, they're, they're more than almost any other online uh, fashion retailer um, because they're only putting on there what they already know people are going to want. Um, Birchbox, um, unbelievably data-driven in being able to understand what it is to put in those boxes. The introduction of a men's box, because they realized there was a huge amount of demand um, by men, uh, and it wasn't something that was there in the first place. It's only something that they learned from the data. Um, and being able to get the contents of those boxes right, and being able to make them personal, and being able to make them geographical. Um, Mint, a financial services product that actually should have been done by a bank. And one of the single biggest questions that's asked with a lot of these things is, why are the experts, the, the businesses that have been around for hundreds of years, why are they not the ones offering some of these products and services up? Um, mobile phone ringtones included. Um, eBay completely changing what they're doing um, and actually creating a, a sense of, of offering, um, not the um, sort of search-driven approach to eBay. I want to buy something, I search for it, I find it for sale, but actually based on what you've looked at and done previously, actually servicing up things up to you. Um, uh, completely keeping eBay relevant uh, and completely um, updating its value and its usefulness. Um, Walmart, uh, the, the most data-driven um, and technology-driven uh, retailer uh, probably anywhere, um, the sheer amount of money they've spent to be able to understand across all of their channels in a joined up way how to make 
the Walmart proposition about value um, land on, on a personal basis, on a regular basis, so that your weekly shopping and your monthly shopping is actually fulfilled in a very, very personal way. You're getting the products you want, but you're getting them in a way that matches your spending cycles. Uh, and Netflix, as we know about, um, but taking a huge amount of, of, of content um, consumption time um, because it matched the way people want to consume content and then started servicing and, and, and putting that together. Um, when we start looking at the social value, um, you know, Intel creating Not Impossible, um, a data-driven business which was purely about being able to leverage the sheer scale and expertise that Intel have with data to create prosthetics for children who have not been able to have access to that um, and to be able to do that in a way in parts of the world uh, that was not previously there, um, leveraging all of their expertise to actually do something meaningful and valuable. Um, Glow, a business that has one single purpose um, that absolutely aligns with, with real people, and that is a healthy pregnancy. Um, so, you know, these are businesses um, which have uh, understood that they have a role to play in bringing their expertise, bringing their experience, and understanding what data can do um, into a way that's meaningful. So when we start to look at what we can do about things, how we can actually start to close this gap, we know that being me meaningful will resonate. We know that it's important that businesses play uh, a purpose beyond just finding profit. Um, and we know that data can give us that much more information. But how do those two things come closer together? How can we make meaningfulness uh, and a sense of that, that purpose something that's not just philosophical, but actually can land on a daily basis? Um, the first thing is a meaningful value exchange. Um, uh, the number of conversations that I hear that start with what data shall we get or what data do we need, um, completely the wrong starting point. The right starting point is actually to understand what value, what meaning can we offer. That could be very practical. That could be for, I don't know, an, an e-commerce retailer that you might be able to shop by color because actually the way that you judge your clothes is based on the right color for you. Yellow is not yellow is not yellow, so I've been told. Um, but if there's a slight shade of yellow that's right for you, why does no online e-commerce retailer provide you the ability to shop by color? It's the way that women behave, it's the way that men behave, it's very natural, it's been going for a long time, but we're not offering that value exchange. If we were to offer that value exchange, if we're off, offered to find something that makes that experience very meaningful, we can leverage that data. That's very practical. On, a, on, a, on, a, on another level, how do we find the sense of what customers uh, and consumers speak about within the broad space that we operate in, and how can we find a way to actually bring value to that? How can we leverage the data assets that we might have as businesses to actually make that more meaningful? That's going to go at some point. Again, some examples of people doing it well. Um, this is Pepto-Bismol who, uh, you know, uh, understood in a very populist way the hangover. Um, and so um, taking a product that, that existed um, very much in the um, biological, you know, this product will help you uh, feel better, um, actually started to um, create a value exchange around before you go out, before you have a big meal, before you do those things. Actually, now we have a value exchange that brings our product into something that's personal to you. Um, Bonobos, uh, looking at providing shirts and, sh and trousers for, for, for men, um, looked at things and realized that one of the single biggest frustrations that men have is actually shirts that don't fit, being able to find that. So a meaningful value exchange. Let us understand who you are, and on the basis of that, we will make sure that you have a shirt that's right and actually they cut down on the number of trousers they were selling because it was more about the shirt. So this business has completely changed by this data value exchange. Um, Coca-Cola, um, uh, an experience where you can create a drink of your choice, over 100 different variations of a drink that you can then start to save. It becomes personal to you. There's a value exchange. It's about you. It's about what you want to drink. Uh, these, are, these are value exchanges that are, that are, that are practical they're about the product, but they're also meaningful and relevant. The second biggest one, and it's probably the one that you hear least about, because if anybody talks to a business or a brand around data, it's usually around the technology. 
we've got shit that will make it work for you, or it's about the data, we'll get you data. Um, very rarely is it about actually the business itself. Um, and with most of the clients that we work with, the opportunity will only be realized organizationally. Um, there is a massive uh, generation gap uh, in the way that businesses hire people um, and, and, and actually the skills uh, that are needed. Um, at the moment, there's this massive separation. We have data and technology over here. Somewhere in the middle are people called analysts, and then we have people who actually operate a business. Quite a large gap in between, and quite a large gap in the skills that go in there. Um, so as organizations, and actually as marketing organizations, if we're looking at how we create better advertising, better marketing, sell more products, the first and, and, and probably major thing we have to do is actually look at what skills that we, we, we recruit and how we bring data-driven decision-making much closer to the day-to-day -day reality. It's the hardest thing to do. It's not the sexy thing. It's not an app, but it is very important. Um, there are people who are, who are going about doing this and looking at creating you know, uh, a, a very visible, everyday uh, you know, decision support. What decisions can I make? What actions can I take? How can I test whether those actions are good actions? How can I create some scenarios? If I do this, then what will happen? Uh, if I do that, what will happen after that? Uh, these are the opportunities. This doesn't take away gut instinct and domain expertise. It doesn't take away decades of knowing what your business and what your brand does. But it enhances that, and it brings to that a speed and a scale of decision making um, that can be comfortable and more comforting. Um, recruiting, training, and finding these people um, when you look at the CVs that are out there, when you look at LinkedIn, when you look at the way recruiters recruit, the first thing I would be doing is talking to my HR function and saying, why do we not have anything about data, anything about analysis, anything about decision making in our skill set? Um, because we're only proliferating uh, an education system that's not providing this, um, university education that's not providing this, um, apprenticeships that are not providing this, um, and yet the single biggest job shortage, job skill shortage in the world today is people who understand data and how to work with it. Uh, that doesn't mean it's the technical side of it. It means that they know it's people who know what to do with it, what questions to ask, what hypothesis to create. Um, you know, in advertising and marketing, the, the, the talent has always been about creativity. And that creativity still, probably more than ever, is important. But along with that, what has to happen is people who can blend those two things together and understand where and when creativity can be slightly more focused, it can be slightly broader, it can be slightly more nuanced um, with, with decision making. And then thirdly is to bring um, the data and the creative experience closer together. Um, you know, in most businesses at the moment, if, if you look at what a customer, what a consumer experiences, what they see and listen to and touch and feel, it's a long way away from data. Data sat in a dark room somewhere in a system that probably doesn't work that well, probably doesn't, has very clear where it comes from. There might be some analysis that's gone on in there at some point. That might be put into some kind of campaign planning. That might at some point get into a brief. That might at some point get into the actual execution uh, maybe of some advertising, maybe even better at a service or a product level. It's quite a large gap. Um, sometimes that's months in between. Um, so it kind of negates the benefits of data. Um, the examples that I'm going to show you in a minute are, are where data and the creative experience have come very close together. Now, that requires a, a level of, of, of sort of technology and skills that's even greater. It starts to move us into automation. It starts to move us into um, algorithms. And it starts to move us into artificial intelligence. Some of the guys out here that you can go and talk to are, are, are people who are doing this on a daily basis. They're bringing um, data into a way that's very accessible, um, that sits right with the creative experience. Virgin Atlantic with Taxi 2. How can they leverage all of the data they have, but through the experience of an app, provide you a cheaper, faster, more efficient way of getting to the airport for your flight? Um, it is an algorithm that's sitting underneath that. It is data, but it's not somebody making decisions of when to send you an email or when to uh, send you a piece of communication. Uh, it is something that's leveraging all of the data from all of the systems, um, but right there, right next to that experience that's very personal to you. 
Um, British Gas with Hive, again, um, we know in the energy industry with smart meters and, and the benefits of this, um, almost meaning less for a, a customer um, for something that they don't see, uh, they just want to work, um, and is highly confusing when it comes to buying it. British Gas being able to take that and go, actually, no, let's make that visible, let's make that something that's an experience, let's connect all of these things together in a way that you can understand your consumption. Um, the data sits right next to the, the experience. Um, very, very few businesses have this opportunity to start from scratch. Uh, very few experiences to be able to start and architect uh, their business in a way that makes this easy. Um, so it, it's more of a challenge, but it is a challenge uh, that can be achieved. Uh, and, the, and these are some examples. Um, well, thank you. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so just just in closing, I, I think you know there's there's a, a huge amount uh, within that story, and 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 you know in a very short space of time trying to bring it together. I think that the, the the final thing I would say is, um, in in every organisation, um, every person uh, has an imperative to understand what data can do in their role. Um, whether it's creative, whether it's in supply chain, whether it's in decision making, whether it's in planning. Um, and, and within marketing and within advertising, the opportunity is great. Um, we're on the very early stages, um, but it means thinking about things differently um, and thinking about how working together and connecting the dots together um, and using the data to help us connect those dots together um, actually will create the kind of um, alignment with our customers that they expect uh, that they're experiencing and will help to close that gap. Um, the, the, the broader that gap will be, the more at risk uh, existing businesses will be from disappearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, what did I tell you, the Bruce Springsteen and Gaper? Um, we've got five minutes now to do a quick Q&A with Ben before we move into panel discussion. So if anybody's got a question, please could you raise your hand, let us know who you are and where you're from, and we can start the questions. Okay, great. Um, uh, I was speaking to somebody yesterday at an event and they said that they thought that data actually would stifle the creative process. How would you respond to that? A very simple um, uh, response is that data is just another medium for creativity. Um, you know, if you go all the way back to Leonardo da Vinci, you know, one of the most creative people uh, that ever existed. Um, and there was, uh, you know, data that sat at the heart of everything that he did, uh, his study of the human body and, and everything else, um, the way that he uh, created a sense of a formula around his art. Um, it's just another medium. Data is not a thing. It has no inherent uh, value on its own. So um, creativity in its purest expression uh, is being able to create some value and some purpose from something. Um, and I think whether you look at that from oil painting or from uh, making movies or TV ads or the normal way we think about creativity uh, in the advertising sense, um, it is there for um, creative people with a creative mindset to create some value from it. I didn't use that in everything that I spoke about, but at the heart of being able to create something that's got a purpose and a meaning for people, it is being creative with that data and finding things out about it. Again, some of the people that you're going to see out here are people who have created incredible pieces of art, um, from, from, from Natalie with her sculptures to some of the artists who are creating art live out here today based on some data that we gave them this morning. Um, there, is a, there is an inherent creativity when uh, it, you can understand how to do that. I don't see these two things at odds. I think it's a nonsensical argument to, to be able to, um, to create. Uh, and it's a way of being able to polarize um, what people feel their comfort zones are. Uh, so I, I, do I, agree I don't have much way. truck with it. <laughs> Any more questions? No? Okay. Okay. One more, I've got one more. <laughs> so Ben, all this sounds great and really inspiring and quite kind of future focused. If you could give um, the people in the room one thing they could take back to their organizations and do differently, what would it be? Um, I would... Um, I would say go and ask some questions in your business about what, what you've got access to, uh, what's there, uh, and start asking some questions about um, how can you uh, understand uh, in a much richer way 
um, what your customers are doing. Uh, and if you start there, some amazingly surprising things will come out of that that you can then use. So go and ask some questions. Thank you, Ben.